If you're new, welcome. My name is Ryan. I'm your pastor, and we uh, exist, the chapel family exists to fill every street with the love of Jesus. Um, as we press into God, we do so by going through books of the Bible because we believe it is God's eternal word, and today we are in Psalm 118. So if you have a Bible, you can flip there. If you have a fake Bible, you can tap there, and that is where we are going to be camping out this morning, Psalm 118. Uh, and this is a psalm about God's love. This is a psalm about God as our refuge and how we can enter in to him as our refuge. So if you're a type of person today who is under stress or has anxiety or fear or struggles with depression, today is the day for you. Or if you're the type of person here and you try to manage life all on your own and you constantly find yourself weary and tired, today's message is for you. We are going to pray and then we're going to jump into it. Uh, Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I ask that you would work the miracle that only you can, that you would change lives and hearts today. Lord, I ask that you would do what only you can, that you would fill your people with faith. Lord, I ask that you would do what only you can do, that you would reach into those who are here visiting today, maybe those who have questions or are skeptics, and that you would make your presence and your power and your truth known to them. God, I, I pray that as we jump into this psalm, you would equip us, that you would empower us, but most of all, that you would inspire us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray, all God's kids said, amen. So we're going to read a little, talk a little. Psalm 118, verse 1. 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Everyone say, give thanks. Just making sure you're with me that you had your super coffee. Why do we give thanks? Very next line, for his steadfast love endures forever. And then it goes on. It says, let Israel say. So if we have any people who are um, Jewish people here, let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, no Jewish people with me. Let the house of Aaron say, I, I thought we might have some. Let the house of Aaron say, if you're a part of the priest lineage, his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, still waiting. Let those who fear the Lord say, I knew that some of you guys could read, even though most of you haven't read a book since college or high school. I knew you could do it. When I read the Psalms, this line is going to come rolling on us. And there are some Psalms where this line, his steadfast love endures forever. It goes over and over and over again. And it reminds me of something. This Psalm, I believe, sets us up for how to live our lives with God. This Psalmist starts with gratitude based on what God has done. Now, there's a little experiment I've been trying, and I, and I don't always do great at it, but I've been doing much better at it lately, and that is this. Um, I realized that I was beginning my days reacting to things. And let me give you an example. Um, I've got one of these. I wake up, because this is my alarm, uh, and it's right here, charging, giving me probably some sort of bad stuff in my brain, signals, whatever. And I pick it up, and I used to just jump right on. I'm just going to go into it, see what notifications I have, emails, text, messages, Instagram, just start going through it. But then I realized something was happening. Um, I was starting my day reacting to what other people were doing and saying and being. I was starting out my day from a reactionary position rather than a proactive position. I was starting out my day not being grateful for what God has done for me, but already reacting and connecting and answering and dealing with the things that are coming inward not from God. And I know some of you um, are addicted to your phones. I know some of you are like me. Some of you aren't. I know that there are people in here, no joke, have flip phones. You guys, there are people in 2018 that have flip phones. They need Jesus. <laughs> but, because how do you get your Bible on your flip phone? I don't know how that works. But, but one thing I do know is that they, they probably have a different start up. They have a different way to boot up their morning. And I've been working on this, so I grab my phone now, and I go, Bible app. And now, because, um, because what I did, we have all these home screens, I put a different Bible app on different pages. So no matter where my phone opens, Jesus is like, hey, I just met you. This is crazy. Sorry, there's an old throwback for those of you. Uh, and I, and I, I open it, and I start to read, and I think, and I put on some brainwave music, you know, a little brain FM to get my brain going in the right direction. So I'm not instantly reacting 
to what others do around me, even though it's screaming at me. Now, part of it I do want to ignore because um, I've got friends and they wake up earlier than I do and they send me loving messages in the morning like, hey, come to the gym or hey, check this out. And I'm like, hey, no way. Um, Hey, no thanks. And I want to take back my morning and start it with God. Now, this is key. Because if you don't start your morning with God, if your boot up process is reacting to problems, then instantly the trajectory of your day is dictated by others and not by what God has done for you. So start by giving thanks for God's steadfast love endures forever. Now that's a word that I I really love. I love the word steadfast. We don't use it enough. Um, We don't use the word steadfast enough. There's certain words that I miss. um, Certain words that I'm trying to keep. Like for example, the words from the 80s, I'm trying to keep those around. Like, that's why you hear me say rad a lot. I'm not going to let rad die. Uh, you guys might all let it die, but when it comes back around, because look at all these kids nowadays. Like I just met a teenager. I just saw a teenager talking. I didn't meet her. Talking during the lobby today. She's wearing an, a vintage MTV jacket, like a legit from the 80s, 90s jacket. And they call it vintage from the 90s. <laughs> let that simmer in. <laughs> vintage 90s jacket. And I, I thought... I thought, wow, this is, it's all going to come back around. Now, I'm hoping that Bible language will come back around because steadfast love endures forever. I, I think we should bring steadfast back into our daily vocabulary. I think we should bring it in with our kids, just raise them up to be steadfast human beings. But then you have to ask, like, what does that even mean? Like, if I asked you, if I quizzed you, I'm not going to call anyone out. But if I said, would you define steadfast for me without Googling it on your flip phone? Would you be able to? Would you be able to say steadfast? Is it, is it steady and quick? Is it steady like a, as the beating drum? Like what is, what is the combination of that word? It's the constant flowing and going. It is always coming at you. God's love is a one-way love. God's love collides with you, crashing down from heaven upon you. And thankfully, thank God, it has nothing to do with you. He's not waiting for you to become a better version of yourself to pour out his love. He says, I am going to dump my love on these people so that they can be loved in a way they've never been loved before. Start your day out with that. Start your day out not being reactive to the things coming on around you, but proactively seeking after God and making Him your true north every morning. Because the very next verse hits us. Out of my distress. Okay, I just need to know who I'm dealing with here in this service. Who here has been uh, stressed out in the last 24 hours? Like stressed out. Okay, who here has been stressed out in the last three days, 72 hours? Okay, who here has not been stressed all week? Seven days, no stress, just peaceful. You come home, your kids give you foot rubs. Your kid gives you a foot rub, Gary? That's that's Jesse's dad, and he should be having a good week because he surprised uh, Jesse, our children's director, flew in. Jesse had no idea. It was an amazing thing. So if you're not having a good week, something is desperately wrong. It's like coming off of a cruise and saying I had a terrible time. But you should only say that if you're on that cruise with that one flu thing. Now, we all have stress. Now, and this psalmist is giving us a, a recipe to get out of our stress, to, to find a refuge from our stress. And I want you to notice what he says. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. Stress is a pendulum for us. And I I haven't figured this out yet. I think it's human nature. We try to be self-reliant, self-contained. We don't want to tell other people our problems. But here's how it starts. Here is good, and here is extreme stress, otherwise known as distress, like massive stress. What happens is this. Our life is good, and something starts to happen that makes us stressed out. This is the stress pendulum, and it's swinging. And what we do is we call out to something that is not God first until it gets really serious. So let's say had a long day at work, tons of emails, your inbox still has got like 1,072 emails that are unopened, and you've got to get to those, hypothetically asking for a friend. And um, you get there, and you get home, and you think, I'm just so stressed out. Something that you may say that I say is, like, I just need to unwind. Some of you just said it didn't even let me finish, because you're like, I got unwind. You're so wound up. I need to unwind. So, so what do we do? We, we turn on our favorite show, and we, we watch it for 45 minutes to an hour, to an hour and a half, to season one, two, and three. We call this binging. We're all familiar with it. It's a pastime. It used to be binging on Ben and Jerry's. Now it's binging on Netflix. Literally, we binge on virtual media now. But all we're doing when we binge is we're, we're calling out to Netflix, 
O Lord Netflix, will thouest save me from the hell that is my day? And you pause, stress, and you turn to the God of Netflixion. And you pray to that Lord. And maybe you bring in the demigods of Budlision, of Red Winion. And you turn to these things to, to try to pause your stress. The psalmist knows. This psalmist starts out his day with the God focus. God, you've given me so much. I'm going to have this attitude of gratitude all day today because you love me. And if you love me, nothing goes wrong. And when stress comes in, I'm going to call out to you. I'm not going to call the Netflix. I'm not going to call on other people. I'm going to call to you because I need you because I know you are the only one that could do something about this stress. And the interesting thing about stress and distress is that it traps us. And we all know this. It, that's why it says, out of my distress, I called the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me free. Stress is a cycle that can trap you over and over again. That's why the Bible refers to this as freedom. Because stress is like you, you're the fly and you go in the spider's web. And it's tangled up. And the more you move, the more you get tangled in the web. And some of you are in that mode of life right now. The anxiety is overbearing and crushing. The financial weight, the relationship weight, whatever's going on in your life, some of you have so much stress. It's affecting your physiology. It's affecting your body. And some of us are calling out to these other things to find freedom. But we're calling out to the wrong thing. You can't call out to these other things that have no power to get you out of the spider web. All they're doing is injecting you with the same poison that a spider would so that you are still and in a coma. The only one who can free you from the web of distress is God. So call out to God and he will set you free. And here's what it says in verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. There's a New Testament version of this. Perfect love casts out all fear. When I, what can a man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. And that's a big helper. I would love to walk in the reality that God is our, is my helper every day. If, if we knew and understood how much God is for us, it would change the way we walk around our house. It would change the way we walk into meetings. It would change the way we walk into coffee shops. If we knew God was for us, it would change the boldness that we have. Too many of us live in fear of what others think because we forget that God is on our side and he is our helper. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Now, this is, um, this is good because... You start your day with gratitude, looking at God's love. And then when you have distress, don't call out to other things. Call out to God. And I know that it's, it's habitual. We do it. Light stress, we call out to friends. Medium stress, we call out to winding, winding down and to wind down and to relax. And then when we get to the end of our rope is when we usually call out to God. My hope as a pastor is that our people, we as a family, we learn to call out to God in the very beginning. Don't call out to God when your kid is leaving the house and moving out at 17 or 18 because they don't like you. Don't call out on God when you're at the end of your financial rope. Don't call out to God when your marriage is hanging by a thread. Call out to God when one little strand of your marriage thread breaks and there's still a strong rope. Because God can repair that much easier than he can when there's something at the end. Because at the end, you've let sin in. You've let divisiveness in. You've let hatred in. And God can do anything. He can work the miracle. But wouldn't it be nicer if we gave it to God in the beginning of our problems instead of waiting until things got to level 10? So here we go, though, because now we're, we're talking about getting out of this stress, and here's where we get out of stress. Here's the safe place. Verse 8, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Refuge, safety, security, comfort. Uh, these past three weeks have been, for me, the craziest three weeks of Florida weather I've ever experienced. I've been here almost three years now, and, um, and I'm not going to lie. I do not like getting up when it's this cold. When it's sub 50, 45 to 50, this service is way more crowded, which tells me you don't like to get up when it's this cold. And I don't know why, because my thermostat in the house still says like 72, 73. But I know in my soul that when I go outside, my skin will burn, my lips will chap, and I'll look around and wonder where the snow is. I know that like many of you, 
My snowware is in storage in the attic. And it's too inconvenient to get that. So I walk outside in 39 degrees and short sleeves. I don't know what to do when the snowflake icon pops on my dash this morning. I don't know if that means don't drive, you'll die, or it's just letting me know that it's cold as if I didn't notice. What I do know is that as humans, we love comfort. We're, we love comfort so much, we're actually averse, we're against change. We don't want change to happen because we love comfort, we love status quo, but I'm telling you, if you want to step into a life with God, you've gotta get used to change. Because every day, it's a matter of changing from relying and trusting in something that's not God to relying and trusting in something that is God. We call this repentance. And in this verse, he's just comparing what we take our refuge in. Some of us take refuge in money. We say, if I have got this many dollars in my account, then I have made it. Let me tell you, like being raised by, by a single mom, my mom worked her heart out, two jobs, three jobs, uh, constantly working to, to provide for us. We had food and shelter. I thought I made it when I was like out of the single digits of dollars per hour. Like my first job, they were going to pay me 12 bucks an hour as a telemarketer my freshman year of college. I was like, Dude, 12 bucks an hour. I have made it. Life over. Game complete. Mic drop. I'm out. And then when I got a salary, I was like, wait, wait. So you're going to pay me whether or not I'm here? I like this salary. And, and I, I kept, I mean, the next thing, and, the next, and then what is it for me? What is it for you? Some of you may think, if I just have a little bit more, let me tell you this, like all of the studies are like, it's somewhere around 75 to 79, depending on what, what you're reading nowadays. But those are supposed to be the happiest people. You make that much a year, you're like super pumped, happy in life. You make more than that, you start to get more stress. You make less than that, you're always stressed about money. But we always want more. I think it's because we're looking to money to be our refuge. We're looking to security of finances, of property, of your portfolio to keep you safe. The thing you take refuge in is what matters most, not just the fact that you take refuge. The, um, this past week, yesterday, I've got a lot of friends who still live in Hawaii, and there was this crazy thing. I don't know if you saw the story or not, but a, an alert went out to all of the people that were in Hawaii. So all of my friends who have their Hawaiian cell phones were posting on Instagram and, and Facebook and social media saying, ballistic missile on the way, imminent danger, seek shelter immediately, and then the bottom said, not a drill. And one of my friends said, I'm, I'm hiding, I'm, in a, I'm hidden away, I went under a table. And then I had these flashbacks, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not so, uh, I'm not young enough to where I didn't experience the end of the Cold War. So I remember, like my elementary school years, they do the drills. We're going to do a drill, everyone get under your desk. And I must have been dumb as a post back then, because now I'd be like, why am I getting under my desk? If this bomb hits, it's over. I mean, we're done. Like, what am I? My, my pre-IKEA plywood-looking desk is going to save me from a ballistic missile? And I was thinking about my friends in Hawaii, like, oh, like, what are they under over there? Like, there's, they're under bamboo furniture and palm fronds? Like, what, what are they, they going to do? And then it turned out to be this mistake. I'm sure that there's a bunch of fired people. Bummer. Um, but, but I was thinking about refuge. Because what we seek refuge under is what is the, the thing that matters. It's not just the fact that we seek refuge, it's that we get refuge under God. We look for safety under God. He is our covering. It's not a matter of just saying, yeah, I think this might keep me safe or that might keep me safe. And I love the, the words that this psalmist uses. Trust in, take refuge in the Lord. Don't trust in man. That means don't trust in the things that we can create or accumulate to save you and keep you safe. Trust in the Lord. And then he goes to the next part. Take refuge in the Lord. Don't trust in princes. Now, to modernize this, don't trust in your government. Don't trust in your presidents. Don't trust in your Congress to be your refuge. They cannot do for you what only God can. And I, I think um, as we have more and more access to the leaders and the governors and the kings and the presidents of our world, we'll understand that they don't know as much as we wish they would know. And they can't keep us as safe as we wish they could. You, you may have noticed that Christianity has somewhat bundled up with politics. And I've taken great, gone to great painstaking efforts to unbundle Christianity with politics because of verses like this. It is so easy 
to look to someone and say, they will save me. They will make this okay. They will get this done for me. If that were the case, then don't you think Jesus would have gone to the powerful instead of the poor? Don't you think he would have gone to the steps of Rome instead of the shores of Galilee and Nazareth, this backwoods fishing village? Jesus didn't go to the kings. He went to the crowds of the broken. Seek refuge in God. Don't trust in princes. Sometimes when I, I'm just looking at the way people attach their lives to something other than God, they attach their lives to money or to their property or to their success or, or to politics, I just think, man, it's, it's like this. In Irma, I did these ridiculous videos. When Irma was going on, it was my first hurricane like, that I was like that was coming toward me. And I went out and I was like being a newscaster on Facebook. And I don't know why, like there was a couple moments where I did this Australian accent, it was ridiculous, okay? But I was all pumped. I was like, and we're here reporting, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and my California friends are watching, and I was like, this is the greatest. Look at our pond, it's filling up crikey, you know? And, um, and as I was doing that, like there's stuff flying around. Um, my, my wife is like, what are you doing? Get inside. My mother-in-law's laughing. She's doing a live video of me as I'm live videoing myself. It's ridiculous, this whole scene. And, and it, granted, it was. It was an actual hurricane. Now, just to be fair, like my rank of fear of natural disasters is like tornadoes top, uh, and we have tsunamis, hurricanes, and earthquakes. That's probably my ranking of scariest. So I'm not, so I wasn't super worried about it, and I want to be with Jesus, so I'm, I'm good out there. But then I, I thought, man, as I saw the news, some people did some knuckle-headed things out there. And I thought, I mean, people are seeking safety in things that aren't going to keep them safe. They're going in these flimsy little boxes. And then I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I did this like safety video where I said, you want to seek shelter from a hurricane? Get in a cardboard box. And then like for an earthquake, you want to be safe during an earthquake? You should go outside under power lines. You just go on and on about the ridiculousness of it because no one would do these things, but we do them in our lives every single day. We go out and we run to something else to be our refuge. We trust in something else. None of you would trust in a, a, an empty refrigerator box to keep you safe in a hurricane, but we do this with our lives every day. We trust our lives into money's hands or a career or a boss or a family or our children or pol political leaders. Don't do it. Seek refuge in God. Now, how do we seek refuge in God? We're going to jump down to verse 18. This is how we do it. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. So how do we get into this refuge? We enter through the gate. If you're a Bible nerd, it should be triggering something. Jesus is the gate. We enter through him. When we enter through Jesus the gate into God's refuge, we are covered with Jesus' likeness. Uh, well, something that I was thinking about in regards to, how can I explain this, being covered with Jesus' likeness? My daughter loves uh, two things in life, maybe three. Um, she loves food, kids' YouTube, and I think she loves us, our family. I think she loves our family. But I know for sure she loves kids' YouTube and food. Now, my daughter, um, as she's looking at YouTube, she'll find something she likes in this kid's YouTube, and she'll say, Daddy, can we do this? Because she knows that I give her things that her mother won't. Um, for example, like when she comes home from school each day, she always wants snacks and food. Right after dinner, right after lunch, she'll say, Daddy, can I have a snack? Can I have a treat? And if Amy's around, I can't, I can't give her treats. But if Amy's not around, I can give her lots of treats. And I give her treats because I'm trying to purchase her love for future occasions, okay? Um, so she'll come home from school and say, Daddy, is Mommy home? And I'll say, no, 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 Mommy's out right now with a friend. Oh, can I have a treat? Sure, what do you want, sweetie? Ice cream. I'll get you ice cream. Give her some ice cream. Is that all? Oh, Daddy, can I have Oreos? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll put one Oreo in your ice cream. Daddy, how about free Oreos? You can't say no to her. She's adorable. So I'm like, okay, you can have three Oreos, but you have to promise me, Savannah, two things. One, you don't tell your brothers. Two, you definitely don't tell your mother. Okay, Daddy, okay. She eats the ice cream afterwards. She just looks at me with these eyes of love. Daddy, I love you. And the rest of the day, she's all daddy. She'll come up and say, Daddy, do you want to cuddle? I'm like, oh, this is why I give you ice cream, girl. Let's cuddle. <laughs> and she'll cuddle. And then she'll go to bed at night. She'll look at me, Daddy, I love you so much. And then she'll say, 
thank you for my treat. And I say, you're welcome. Don't tell your mother. Amy always knows because, like, there's a trail of ice cream drops from the table where Savannah sits to the sink. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at the hiding thing. But, but when, I, when she enters in and I, I bless her, I give her what she wants. God won't always give you what you want, but he'll give you what's best for you. So that's where my analogy really breaks apart. But God gives you what's best for you. God, God wants to bring you in to give you joy that's not a temporary joy, but an everlasting joy. And to enter into his refuge leads to my next Savannahism. And that is this. Right now, her thing is that she wants a chocolate fountain. Now, you heard, remember we said, when you enter into the refuge, you enter through Jesus. He is the gate. He is the way in. He is the door, the gate. We enter through him. And because he is God and Savior, he covers us with his goodness. And he pays for our sinfulness. So when we enter in, we look like Jesus, live like Jesus, love like Jesus. And I thought, how can we communicate being covered? And I, I got it. Savannahism, number two for the day. Savannah now wants a chocolate fountain. Some of you have seen these. Now, I, um, I will probably end up borrowing a chocolate fountain or renting one from somewhere. If one of you has one, please, you can bring it to my house so that I can do what I'm about to tell you next because I know what's going to happen. We're going to get this chocolate fountain. It's going to be like a three-tiered sterling silver pump of goodness and just blobbles up the chocolate and down. We've all seen this. It looks amazing and smooth. And there's going to be Rice Krispie treats and marshmallows, and maybe cheesecake bites, and then fruit that none of my kids are going to touch. And we're going to take the sticks and we're going to stick in the marshmallow. And I can already see how it's going to go down. We're going to cover the marshmallow with chocolate. And say, mmm. And then we're going to keep starting, keep going. And then all of a sudden, we're going to run out of the sticks because the fondue 70s called and took all their sticks back. And then I can picture in my head, Savannah is going to run out of what she likes. There's only going to be apple slices and cheesecake bites left. And she doesn't try cheesecake because she's scared of crust. So she's going to look around and say, where's my marshmallows and my Oreos? I can't dip anything. And Savannah's going to look up with eyes of hope into that chocolate fountain. And she's going to go like this. I could just feel it in my bones. And she's going to take it out. And it's going to be like a scene out of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory gone wrong. And she's just going to eat her hand and just lick it. And then I could, I could see what happens next. I could see my boys laughing and saying, ha, 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 ha. And then one of them is going to grab something, some chocolate, and they're going to put it on their hand. And then I can also see what happens next because my wife is pregnant. And uh, during pregnancy, she gets uh, sort of delusional like she's on some, court, some kind of happy drug. It's amazing. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, hey, she's pregnant and happy. I'm going to take some chocolate and put it on her nose because it's cute and I've seen it in movies. It's only cute in movies. I'm going to go, ha! And then I'm going to realize, wait, it's not the happy pregnancy time. It's the other one. <laughs> and that's when chocolate's going to fly toward me. And then before you know it, we're, we're all going to be covered in this chocolatey goodness. It's all over us. Because that's what happens in my family, in my head. In my head, this happens. And I think, I think what we need to understand is, is the more we press into Jesus together, the more we get surrounded by, covered, filled with, assaulted by the love of God for you and for me. It's, it's easy to walk away from God when you're alone. It's harder when you're walking with people that are loving Jesus with you. If you look at some of our teenagers today, they're bleary-eyed. Like right now, they're, some of them are over here, they're sprinkled over here. They, this is what they're literally doing right now. Because they were at some winter jam thing last night, singing with Skillet. Last night, they were all excited because Skillet is so cool. They were headbanging and stuff. But now, but what's amazing about it is that now, because they did this together, they have this amazing bond around Jesus together. And when they go through life now, they're going to be like, hey, and I don't know how it works for adults, but in teenage life, it's like this. I was near you headbanging. I was near you headbanging. We must be best friends forever. I know it's not the same with adults, except for the fact that when we go like golfing together, all of a sudden we're like the chummiest of chums. I went golfing this week on Friday. And I saw some of the guys that I golf with today. And usually it's like, oh, good morning, good morning. But we golfed. And we shared buffalo chicken wraps near each other. So when I saw them this morning, they were, I was like, what is up, brother from another mother, same father? Mmm. You hug them. Because when you're in a Christ-centered community under the refuge of God, together looking to God, encouraging each other toward God, dragging others toward God, you get Jesus more around you. 
God created us to be in community for a reason. Don't run from it. If you want to be in God's refuge, enter in through Jesus and stand with your brothers and sisters in the faith and give thanks because God's love endures forever. And, and here's, here's an interesting thing, verse 22. It's a, the verse, it's a prophecy. First, actually 21, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. God became our salvation through Jesus. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, and it has become, he has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, this is an interesting verse because we've all said this verse. If you're a church person, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's, re it's referring to this particular day, the day that we come into God's refuge through the gate who is Jesus, and we are covered by Jesus. This day is marvelous. It's not just any day. It's not just Mondays or Saturdays to pump yourselves up. It's saying, no, the day that I look to Jesus to be my all in all, to accept and embrace and be loved by him, this day is the day the Lord has made. This is the day he's made for you today. Some of you have let stress and fear and shame dictate your lives. Stop it today and run to the refuge who is Jesus today. If you can't get to him, if you're like, I don't even know how to start, I don't know where to start, my life is so far gone, I can tell you what, there's a large group of people in here who will kick your rear into the refuge, who will grab you and drag you, who will take your hand and say, I will show you it's easy. It's being loved by God for God so that we can now love others in return. This day is the day the Lord has made. Don't run from God this day. Don't seek refuge in something else besides God this day. If you're in distress and stress and fear and anxiety and shame, call out to God this day because this day I need you to know that you cannot shake God's love off of you. God will pursue you, will love you. All he asks is that you bring nothing and say, God, I need you to be my everything. Will you run to him today? Or will you continue to take refuge in non-God stuff? Will you try to run this race by yourself or will you run it with others around you? The victory is yours, church. God has already completed and sealed the deal. It is placing your faith in him that puts you at the finish line. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you would love me with such an everlasting love, that you would be a refuge for me of safety, security, strength, hope, and purpose. Lord, I pray that people in here today who are on the pendulum of stress and distress, that they would call out to you and that not only would they call out to you, but they would call out to those you've put around them to be open, honest, and transparent, to bring needs to the forefront, to be loved, to be held, and to be reminded that no matter what is going on, your love is steadfast for them and will endure forever for them. I thank you for this chapel family, God. Help us to be proactive people who live a life of gratitude, focusing on all you've done for us through Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. All God's kids said, Amen.